Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> let me put the uh, uh, have this on the side so that I can uh, refer to different chapters and sections where we covered some of the things as I talk about it. And uh, most of this overview, I the um, sorry, it's not as a interactive as it could be. <laughs> Maybe in future semesters, I can find a way to make it more interactive. Um, but in terms of, I don't know, I was looking through some of the um, simulations that might illustrate key concepts and I couldn't really find them. So I'll, I'll just leave it here and um, and maybe <laughs> in a future semester, I'll do it in a more uh, satisfying way. So, so, um, so this is the setup and um, what I want to talk about for next uh, 20 minutes or so is um, over, um, recap of what you've been learning for the last, uh, wow, seven weeks, six weeks. So for the last uh, six to seven weeks, you've been learning really about mechanics. And um, it's uh, quite a bit of a big topic. <laughs> That's why it's uh, split into two units. Um, we. We covered in the first unit in the kinematics and dynamics, we covered uh, forces. And that's, uh, I think, really center of mechanics. So when you call back to what we covered in the development of force concept, um, we <laughs> try to introduce a force in a, as a simple way as possible, that it's a kind of push or pull. And, and when we describe, um, when we think, uh, when, we, when we talk about a mechanical description of the universe, uh, that's really what we are focused on. Um, uh, mechanical description in the sense of um, connecting from a cause to effect in a, a very simple way. So, so physics is uh, the fundamental science. And one of the ways um, we can, uh, one of the ways we can do things in physics that uh, sometimes it's difficult to do in biology or even in chemistry is that we choose to deal with the very simple systems so that we can uh, go through everything step by step. Um, so, you know, in this class, we, <laughs> we do less of that because Sometimes going through those things, a step by step involves a lot of math. <laughs> um, and as we are going through this um, operation of uh, mechanical things, the the key central idea that that you will see everything connecting to are is force. The idea of force. Let me see. Um, let me demonstrate what we mean by that. So, uh, you know, we introduced the force in chapter three. And if you call back to, um, so if you call back to chapter two, it, chapter two is where we cover the motion. Motion of, um, we introduced the concepts like acceleration, velocity, speed, so that we can describe motion. And um, and this force connects to motion through Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that um, net uh, net force is related to um, acceleration. So net force is mass times acceleration, or I guess in a way that uh, that illustrates the causation a little bit better. Acceleration through which we can describe all motion. Once we know acceleration of something, then we can look at how its velocity changes. Once you know how velocity of something changes, then you can look at how its position changes. And um, you might remember from section 2.5, how we looked at some example of that. Um, that if you have a constant acceleration, how from that you get all the other motion equations. So, so having that, causation, chain of causation in mind, uh, acceleration is determined by net force. It's a net force divided by mass. So, so force 
connect to all the things that you've seen in motion. Once you know, I guess in some kind of simplified sense, um, while highlighting the danger of oversimplifying, because <laughs> sometimes the systems can get very complicated. So in some simplified sense, once you know force on an object at all times, then you might even say, then you can't, you have determined motion of that object completely, or you can uh, predict its future um, indefinitely into the far future. Um, <laughs> for those of you who might be familiar with, uh, who might have some philosophical training, you might have heard of something called determinism. And really, uh, one of the inspiration for determinism is Newtonian mechanics, where once ideally, theoretically, once you know all the forces acting on all the particles and objects, then the future of the system is determined. Now, all of this, all of this is quite oversimplified. So I don't want to give you an impression that this is what we believe in today. But, um, but force is important in the way that it gives us a handle on how to describe our mechanical universe. And now, Moving forward to unit two content instead of unit one content. This force is also basis of uh, several other concepts that we've introduced. So um, the topics that you've been looking at past few weeks and that you will be doing timed assessment on next week, um, we introduced energy. and we introduced momentum. These are two twin pillars of uh, classical physics or, well, these are two most important quantities in physics. These are the, um, well, two of the most important conserved quantities. And in describing energy, how we connect to energy is that change of energy is related to work. When you do work, you change energy. And the way we define the work, which hopefully you have seen since our opening discussion in unit two, that we have this odd definition of work in physics that somehow seems to work out. That work done is a force times a displacement. Uh, let me say delta x. So force somehow connects to energy or at least the change in energy. And um, if you look back through uh, chapter four, you see that even um, in each of these, with each of these forms of energy, um, how they were derived, how we analyzed it, they all connected uh, to work. So they all, in some sense, connected to an idea of a force, how force affects energy. When we derived the kinetic energy, what we looked at was net force, how net force causes acceleration, and how the acceleration changes speed. And we could associate a kind of quantity of motion that uh, we can quantify through the work done by the force that was causing that acceleration. That's how we introduced the kinetic energy and how we introduced the potential energy, both the gravitational and spring potential energy. It was through the idea of conservative forces that when with a certain kinds of forces, when these conservative forces do negative work, so they take out kinetic energy, that energy isn't gone, that these conservative forces are somehow predictive enough that when they do negative work and take out kinetic energy, you can kind of predict that you can bring it back. Um, you saw that example with the gravitational potential energy. When I lift up an object, gravity does negative work. So as I push this up, it doesn't accelerate up as much. It, does, it doesn't gain much kinetic energy, but you can see that stored energy because when I let go of it, then it accelerates downward and all the kinetic energy comes back. And similar with the, the spring potential energy. So when we are talking about energy and change in energy, they connect you to force. And when we were talking about momentum, that 
and we were talking about momentum that also connected to force. Um, I guess we do momentum, um, we do define the quantity of momentum that's in contrast to the quantity of energy. I think if you look at the chapter carefully, we never really define energy. Um, I, so I think in chemistry maybe, um, or um, I think in sometimes, sometimes energy is defined as ability to the work or something like that but that kind of ends up being circular. So, so my own preference is to just not define energy, but um, leave it as a kind of quantity that we define so that, or who's uh, like formulas, formulas for gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy and other kinds of energy later on. The quantity that we define so that it is conserved. So, um, so we don't really give a very concrete definition of energy. In contrast to that, we do give a concrete definition of momentum. Momentum, it's a vector quantity. It's a quantity that has a direction and it's equal to mass times velocity. That's momentum. It's quite simple. <laughs> There's a, nothing more to say about that. Um, and this quantity momentum also relates to force because um, as you might remember from the chapter, we talk about impulse. And impulse is connected to momentum through um, impulse gives you the change of momentum. And in terms of defining what impulse is, we defined it as force times the duration of time. And there's quite a bit of uh, similarity between how we define impulse and how we define work. Work was a force times the displacement impulse is, uh, it's also something related to force and it's a force times the duration of time. And that uh, small difference does have quite a bit of impact in terms of uh, work, uh, you know, both the force and displacement are vector quantities. And when you multiply them, you have to multiply it in a special way so that the end result doesn't have a direction. Energy is a scalar. Um, with the impulse, it's a force of times duration of time and duration of time is not a vector. It's just, uh, you know, I guess you could call it a scalar. Um, it, it doesn't have a direction at least not in space. So uh, impulse is just a, a force of vector times some scalar and impulse like momentum is a, a something that has a sense of direction. And um, so I guess I'm just highlighting the, both the similarity between impulse and work and difference between them. And what I want to highlight again is how all of this ties back to force, that it's uh, um, the, the study. Of, so, so far <laughs> what we've been doing is um, study of force. Oh, and uh, the discussion of momentum has, um, um, it has, uh, uh, important connection with uh, something that we covered earlier. Earlier, when we were covering a uh, force, we had uh, Newton's uh, third law, which um, to summarize, it says, um, if uh, an object, uh, uh, so there's a force, if uh, there's a force on object B by A, then there is also going to be force on object A which was before exerting the force by B. And these two forces are related in such a way their magnitudes are the same and their direction is opposite. So we covered the Newton's third law when we co were covering force before and it co gets brought back when we do momentum. Uh, Newton's third law connects directly to momentum conservation. You saw that in action somewhere here, let's see. Um, the conservation of momentum. We looked at how um, the, action, the impulse due to action force and reaction force uh, within a system, they cancel out and give you no net change in momentum. Okay, I see a question in the chat. Is time considered a vector in more advanced physics that covers space-time? That is a very good question that um, 
relates to, so the advanced physics that cover space time is what we will get to in unit four under special relativity. And I think one kind of, um, I <laughs> because we don't have quite enough time, um, we don't go into this depth about uh, what we call four vector formalism. It's a, um, so it's a way to handle space time as um, uh, one integrated geometry. Now in that context, time is a component of the four vector. So just like when you have, um, when you have a vector in three dimensional space, you can talk about its uh, direction along one of the axes. Time becomes one of those axes. So in the more advanced physics that covers space time, so we still wouldn't call time a vector on its own, but it would be one of the components of the four vector. So, so you know, positive time, negative time, that sense of direction still does have meaning. And you know, it has meaning now too, you know, future is different from past. Um, yeah, so so that's one of the things that I hope um, you <laughs> you will see uh, at the end of the semester that we'll talk about. I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, yeah, and uh, this uh, kind of strange similarity and um, uh, similarity and difference between energy and momentum they are also connected in a more intimate way in special relativity. Uh, for now, I guess I'm okay with just leaving it, how they are connected both through force. And so that covers about half of uh, mechanics too, you know, work and energy and impulse and momentum. And the rest are what I might call application of mechanics. Oscillations and waves are probably uh, some of the more interesting applications. And when you look at the oscillations, you can kind of see what kind of role force plays there. So let me see how, let me see if I can do it this way. Um, okay, I think that's good enough. Um, so, so, you know, we started to talk, um, we started covering oscillations by talking about simple harmonic motion. And what drives a simple harmonic motion is uh, something like this. It's a um, simple harmonic is driven by a setup situation where you have a restoring force, like a spring force. When you pull a mess one way, then the spring pulls back. When you move the mess the other way, spring pushes back the other way. And in fact, there's a, you know, there's a Hooke's law relationship. The, how much force there is, that's a proportional to how much you displace it. And all of this, uh, when you, you know, actually go through the math, it's a very important in determining the properties of oscillation. Uh, we talked about things like uh, natural frequency of oscillation or period of simple harmonic oscillator. And so, you know, uh, here you <laughs> just uh, see the formula and um, in the process of driving the formula, those relationship of the mass, uh, relationship of the um, force on the mass and the displacement is very important. Um, so, so, so oscillation is one of the applications of these mechanical ideas you have seen. And in fact, when we talk about oscillation, you see energy featuring in, uh, oops, <laughs> you see energy featuring it rather prominently. We talk about how in this oscillation, mechanical energy is conserved. And as this oscillates back and forth, goes from where it has zero velocity, but very large uh, spring potential energy, to where it has zero spring potential energy, but very large kinetic energy, that potential energy is changing to kinetic energy and back and forth. Um, so energy plays a role in describing oscillation. And um, things get more, uh, if you recall, things get more abstract as we, sorry, I'm trying to zoom out here so that it looks more reasonable. Um, 
um, it gets more abstract when we get to waves. So I, I think the direct connection is a little bit gets harder to see when we uh, start talking about waves. And uh, there is a reason for that. Waves are uh, somewhat more general phenomenon than what we've been talking about in terms of energy and momentum. You know, when we have waves, you can actually even talk about uh, waves of people, like a stadium, you know, um, I guess not these days, but more than a year ago, if you imagine going to a sporting event like a, a basketball game or a baseball game or football game, you know, sometimes you see these waves of um, uh, people at the stadium and um, you can actually describe waves like that uh, in a mechanical way. Now, it's not quite a physics that describes the wave. It's more of a psychology, you know? How long do you wait before you, after you see someone next to you doing, raising their hand and that kind of determines how fast the wave propagates. So uh, because waves are more general phenomenon in the world than simply energy and momentum, there's, it's necessarily more abstract, but even so you can see some connection of waves to how um, how uh, how waves connected to other mechanical ideas. For example, um, I think we say somewhere, so these are just defining terms. Um, okay, there's one mention of man energy there. So, um, so, you know, characteristics common to all waves, such as amplitude, period, frequency, and energy. And one thing that, um, yeah, talk, so I don't bring it explicitly. So one of the things that waves do, that almost to all waves do, that uh, waves that are state, people waves at the stadium don't, is it, um, it, it transports energy. And I, I think you can see that most clearly with the example of wave on a string. When you shake one end of the string, that as the disturbance propagates through the string, it's uh, transporting the kinetic energy from one end of the string to the other end. So, so oscillations on waves, that's uh, one of the um, examples of application of mechanics. And in the case of oscillation, you can see the direct connection to forces a little bit more clearly. And even in the case of waves where it gets more abstract, in fact, when we talk about wave interference, you barely see any mention of energy or momentum or force, <laughs> but uh, there is some connection. Um, and, uh, and it gets a little bit farther away with the sound waves and those things. Um, and as we are wrapping up this uh, uh, recap of mechanics, I will say this, um, we do rotation. I want you to see how many of these uh, things, oh wait, let me just change my screen back a little. I want you to notice how many of the things that we talked about in mechanics before get brought back in rotation, except with a slight tweak. So, before we talked about acceleration as in a way of describing motion. We talk about angular acceleration. And before we talked about how force causes acceleration. And here in dynamics of rotational motion, rotational inertia, we talk about how something that's analogous to force causes angular acceleration. We call that torque, and um, and I guess that word analogy is, I, I think that's the key to understanding rotational things. So many things in rotation, there is an analogy to things that we cover in uh, linear motion. And that analogy, at least for me, it really helped me get a handle on a lot of things. I, I think kinetic energy is relatively simple. Um, and that you know connects to like other you know rotational kinetic energy is relatively simple. That connects to the linear kinetic energy, um, and the angular momentum and its analogous rela relationship to momentum, and how momentum relates to force, and how angular momentum relates to torque. Uh, that analogy is what helped me understand um, 
really angular momentum, especially when you look at really <laughs> fun confounding effect like a gyroscopic effect. That's the topic of um, one of the essays <laughs> that uh, you will complete this week. So, so the rotation, it's a kind of a way to look at all these mechanical ideas all over again, but with a slight twist. Uh, no pun intended, uh, with, uh, from a slightly different uh, viewpoint, because uh, there's a lot of analogies that you can draw. And um, and I hope uh, that a different uh, angle at which to, <laughs> again, no pun intended. Uh, I need to find a better uh, dictionary thesaurus. <laughs> um, on a, just looking at these mechanical ideas that you've looked at before, um, in the case of linear motion, looking at it from a different viewpoint in rotation, I hope it'll help you uh, better understand what you understood better and maybe even highlight some of the things that uh, maybe you thought you understand but didn't quite fully. Um, and fluids, I so we could have actually not done any fluid stuff, but. I have to, so that we can say that we covered the Bernoulli's equation. And actually a Bernoulli's equation does have a connection to what we've been covering. So, you know, we covered the energy mechanics and it's one of the important ideas. And what we call Bernoulli's equation or Ber Bernoulli's principle, uh, which looks like this uh, formula here, where it really comes from is the idea of conservation of energy. Um, each of these terms, they stand for, this term stands for kinetic energy. This term stands for gravitational potential energy. And the pressure is in some, a little bit more disconnected way, connected to uh, amount of work that is done on the fluid. So, so yeah, I think I explicitly say here that um, all these are connected to the idea of conservation of energy. So, so fluids are another way we can apply mechanics, but the mathematics of it gets more complicated. That's why I would just um, cover it briefly and then move on. So it is a way to look at things. And I would, uh, you know, speaking as a physicist and someone who believes in the mechanical universe, you know, mechanical description of universe isn't necessarily everything. You know, we don't have a, a rational explanation of consciousness. And I, <laughs> I would have enough humility to say uh, physics isn't everything, but it gives a very particular way to look at the world that I think allows a deeper understanding than uh, simp than uh, pure philosophical view might. And all of that ties into, again, force, um, push or pull. Uh, our goal here is to describe things as uh, simply as possible, or when we can't, uh, you know, try to come up with a situation that's uh, simple enough <laughs> that we can try to describe it simply and understand it simply. So that's uh, the overview recap of mechanics. Again, uh, not quite an um, exam review, because if we were on exam review, I didn't write down nearly enough for formulas, but um, kind of situating where we are, um, what's the point of all these chapters that we've been covering, how they connect together.